Hey, Robia. In part one, we looked at the top five musical mistakes that cause people's tracks to sound more like amateur sounding home recorded demos than professional commercial tracks. So in this video, we're gonna look at the top five technical mistakes now that make the difference between demo and pro. So let's get right to it. So by the end of this, you're gonna be able to, one, rate your tracks technically on a scale of zero to five, hopefully closer to five than zero. And then if you follow part one, rate your tracks both musically and technically on a total scale of zero to 10. And based on this, you're gonna know exactly what it is that you need to work on to get from wherever you are right now to that totally professional commercial sound that you want for your songs. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're just starting out and you're making all these mistakes, or you've been doing this for years and you're kind of just looking for those last little pieces of the puzzle to get your music where you want it. Either way, what I really want for you is to be able to come away from this with a clear plan of what the next steps are that you need to take to get your music to where you want it to be. So to very quickly recap part one, the top five musical mistakes are tuning issues, wrong notes or chords, a balance that's a bit off, arrangement issues, and timing problems. We have to make sure that we get the music right first, otherwise it doesn't really matter what we do technically. So as our guinea pig to demonstrate these musical and technical mistakes, I'm using this song over here called Fallen, when a friend of mine came to me with one of her tracks that sounded a little bit more like a demo than a professional production, I decided to help her reproduce it so that I can use it right over here as an example to help you to improve your tracks. So just in case you missed part one, here's just a couple of seconds before and after of her original song and the new one that we reproduced. As you can hear, there's quite a contrast between the two. Now, before you think that maybe this isn't for me, you know, I don't do girl pop music, well, just keep in mind that it doesn't matter what style of music you're doing or what gear you may or may not have, these mistakes are universal. And by the way, in case you were wondering, no extra fancy gear was used in the reproduced version. We used all the same garage band instruments, uh, except for the piano, and the vocals were re-recorded using a mic and sound card of pretty much the same quality. So we're about to dive into these five technical mistakes, but just before we do that, I want you to listen to about 30 seconds of the original track and see how many mistakes or problems you can find. So hopefully you found a couple. Let's now take a look at these five major technical mistakes. In fifth place, we have the most obvious of the five, but we've got to put it in here because it comes up more often than you think. And that is noise and glitches. Demo tracks often have noises or glitches that distract from the music, while pro tracks sound clean and noise free. Now, unless you're doing some sort of underground dubstep where noise and glitches are part of the sound, it's best to make sure that we don't include these in our tracks. You know, nothing quite screams, hey everyone, I recorded this myself at home, like hearing someone's miniature dashing barking in the background. Unless, of course, your miniature dashing is part of the band, then it's totally cool. Now, fortunately, even cheap sound cards these days are incredibly clean and, you know, they're even quieter than the fancy and expensive tape recorders that they used to use in the past. So this means that as long as you choose a relatively quiet time to record uh, any live instruments, there's really no reason why your track shouldn't sound clean and noise-free. All the other things are very simple to avoid or fix. In our example track over here, the only things that I could find were a couple of noisy ins and outs and regions. Uh, for example, this is what it sounds like over here as these regions kind of go out. 
You hear those little clicks and pops there? Well, sometimes you'll get that when you push stop on a recording or someone moves or something like that. And most of the time, that's not gonna come through in the track. And if it doesn't, you know, that's totally fine. But you just wanna make sure that those don't come through because they can sound annoying or just strange in the background. But besides that, she did a pretty good job. So you know what, I'm gonna give it to her. One point for a clean mix. All right, so here's some key lessons to make sure your tracks stay clean and noise free. Always keep your working sessions at at least 24 bit. You get more headroom, the noise floor is lower, and it's just better throughout. Secondly, avoid clipping. Clipping can create harsh, glitchy sounds that just don't sound very good. Although I must say, most modern doors handle clipping incredibly well. They manage to disguise it somehow, but it's still best to avoid as a general rule. Thirdly, check tops and tails. And by that, I mean the beginnings and ends. And this could be of regions, so sections that you've recorded, or the entire song. Like I showed you a moment ago, sometimes regions can have little clicks and pops when they come in and go out, and you just wanna fade those out if they do. And the entire song, you just wanna make sure that the beginnings and ends are nice and clean, and that there aren't extra instruments in there that aren't playing and just adding extra noise. Fourth is make sure your vocal tracks are clean. Make sure that you use a pop filter while recording to prevent those P's and B's from blowing wind into the mic and distorting it. Clean up any vocal tracks. So I like to edit them pretty close to where they come in and go out. You know, often vocalists will talk in between takes or cough or be looking at some lyric sheet or something and it's causing all kinds of noises in the background. So just edit them pretty close to the tops and tails. And if you need to, just use some fade ins and fade outs on those regions if they have any kind of click or pop sounds. Right, moving on. In fourth place, we have panning. Demos often have strange, inconsistent panning that sounds confusing and out of balance. Well, pro tracks use simple, balanced panning that creates width while focusing attention on the lead elements. Back in the day when stereo first came onto the scene, I think it was around the 50s or more like the 60s, it was quite a novelty. It was like, wow, there's things coming out of two different speakers at the same time. Uh, the Beatles had some crazy panning going on in some tracks with an entire drum kit coming out the one side and vocals the other. So you may be wondering if the Beatles got away with it and it was good enough for all the hippies of the time, why can't we use this psychedelic panning today? Well, for one, people aren't using as much drugs as they were back then to appreciate it. But more importantly, a little invention has come onto the scene since then called the headphones. Now, I don't know what the stats are, but I'd have to say that at least half of all music being listened to every day is done so using some type of headphones. Headphones exaggerate any type of panning, so we need to make sure that it's balanced, otherwise it can sound a bit strange. So in our example track over here, we've got some interesting panning going on. We've got a lot of uh, the vocals panned to interesting positions. We've got like lead vocals panned slightly to the one side, just a couple of percent, and then a backing vocal panned more over to the other side. Let's take a listen to this section over here. And So the lead vocal in this section over here is panned slightly to the left, but then it sounds a bit strange because this backing vocal over here is panned kind of all the way to the right, and it just sounds a bit confusing. It's not wrong, but it kind of just sounds out of balance. This is what it sounds like on the new version with the vocals just straight up the middle. It just sounds less confusing and it's clear that the vocals are leading the song. So some key lessons that we can learn from this. Number one, keep your panning simple. For most types of modern pop, rock, rap, EDM, that kind of stuff, just keep it really simple. Either go center, hard left or hard right. If you're doing more mellow music or classical music and you're going for a more realistic sound stage, so you kind of panning things where you would imagine them being on a stage in front of you, then you can use some more subtle panning, but just make sure that it all balances out. Secondly, keep the most important things in the center. Lead vocals, kick, snare, whatever the lead instrument is, that kind of stuff, just keep it in the middle. Thirdly, keep bass instruments in the center. So for example, your kick drum, your bass guitar, you want that coming right up the middle. 
The low end is where most of the energy is and we want that spread out over both speakers evenly. And finally, balance out the left and right. It's kind of like elementary school algebra. Remember that saying, what you do to the one side, you do to the other? Well, it's the same when it comes to panning. If you pan something hard left, you preferably want something similar to balance it out hard right. This is why we'll often record two electric guitar parts and pan one hard left and one hard right so that they balance each other out. The third most common home recording mistake that I hear has to do with compression and limiting. Demos typically sound over compressed and aren't up to commercial level overall. Well, pro tracks use compression and limiting to bring out the energy in a song and make sure that the overall level is up to commercial standards. After EQ, compression is the most powerful tool that we have to transform the sound of our tracks. It really has completely changed the sound of modern music. And by modern, I mean the past few decades. So all the music that you really like to listen to. Used the right way, compression can bring out the energy, the power and subtle nuances in a performance. But used the wrong way, it can ruin an otherwise good sounding recording. The two most common compression problems that I hear are number one, using too much compression. And secondly, using the wrong settings. So it just sounds a little bit strange. A couple of compression and limiting issues in this track over here. For one, the vocals have quite a lot of compression on them and quite an extreme setting, over 61 ratio, which is a bit high. The attack is probably a little slow, so it's not gonna sound as smooth. And just in general, there's quite a lot of compression happening. This is what it sounds like over here. We are falling to a place we never even knew was here. It just seems to be squashing it a little bit too much for this song. The other problem is that it's not consistent. So some other vocal tracks like this one over here has a compressor, which is very different. It's only got a three to one ratio, a 10 millisecond attack, and it's not doing nearly as much compressing. So the lead vocal seems to change from one section to the next. And then finally, although she's used compression on the master, she hasn't used any limiting. And so the overall level of the track is very soft. I've actually been increasing the level just so that it doesn't sound so extreme between this original one and the new one, but take a listen to what the levels actually sound like. This is the original one over here without any level increase, just like it was, and then I'll play the new version. So quite a big difference in level, isn't it? We want our tracks to have a similar level to other commercial records, otherwise they're just gonna sound unprofessional. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to get into everything about compression over here, but a couple of simple key lessons to keep in mind. One, if you're not sure what you're doing, use less compression than you think. If you can hear the compression, it's probably too much. Secondly, make sure the compression you use is consistent throughout the song for whatever part you're using it on. If it's a lead vocal, make sure that the whole lead vocal is compressed the same way. Third, make sure the compression matches the energy of the song. If it's a Light Miller song, you don't wanna to use too much compression. If it's a more aggressive song, then you can use more. Fourth, try the extremes. The only way to find the right amount is to try both way too much and way too little. So overdo the compression and hear what that sounds like and then you know switch the compression off altogether and then somewhere in between that you should find the balance and lastly use a limiter whenever mastering or doing the final export of your tracks to make sure that you bring them up to commercial level in second place for the most common technical mistakes comes down to effects demos use way too many effects that often sound cheesy and distracting well, pro productions use simple, tasteful effects to enhance key elements of the song. Like most musicians, when I was starting out learning how to produce music, I didn't really understand the basics, things like using EQ and compression. So I did what any over-enthusiastic novice does the first time they hear an echo effect, and I put it on everything. I just figured that these effects must be the key to that professional sound I was looking for. Well, little did I know that this is one of the most common mistakes made. 
A telltale sign of an amateur production is too many and too much effects. You see this in film as well. If you watch a big budget Hollywood movie, you'll notice that the editing they use is pretty simple. Just clean cuts and some fade ins and fade outs. Whereas you can always spot the straight to DVD videos by all the cheesy effects they used, you know, the twirl, the checkerboard effect, the ripple, and who knows what else. It's the same with music. The professional commercial tracks typically stick to pretty simple, tasteful effects. Whereas you can always spot the amateur home recording by the person having used every single effect in the door and way too much reverb and delay. Now, just to be clear, this does differ depending on the style of music. Some styles, such as most dance music for example, rely on more effects and that's totally fine. And I'm also not talking about effects used intentionally to create a certain sound. I'm talking about effects just being thrown on for the sake of it. So just take a listen to one of the vocals in this track and see what you think. We are falling to a place we never even knew. Here. It just sounds very effecty, doesn't it? Now to compare, take a listen to the vocal in the new version. We are falling to a place we never even knew was here. It also has effects on, but it's not nearly as over the top as the original. So if we take a look at what's on this original one over here, uh, we got a whole bunch of things, EQ, compressor, okay, there's an exciter over here, there's a pedal board, what's on this pedal board, right, so there's this chorus -y effect over here, all of these things are probably contributing somehow, let's take a listen to what it sounds like if I just take off the pedal board and the exciter, this is what it sounds like at the moment with them on. To a place. And I'll take them off now. Yeah, already that sounds better. There's also quite a lot of reverb on this vocal in general, which is pushing it very far back in the mix. Now, reverb does come down to preference, and I probably do prefer a slightly dry sound, but in general, I just find that most beginners use way too much reverb on the vocal tracks, which just makes them sound very unprofessional. Okay, here's a couple of key lessons to take away from this. Unless you're purposely going for a very reverberant sound, you want that 80 sound, don't use too much reverb on the vocals. It pushes them back and it makes them sound washy and unclear. If you do use reverb on the vocal and you want to keep it up front, I recommend using a pre-delay of around about 30 to 50 milliseconds. Secondly, get the mix working without using any effects at all. So no reverbs, delays, choruses, or anything like that. You can add them at the end once everything is actually working. If you can't get the mix to work without effects, there's something wrong with it that has nothing to do with effects at all. It probably comes down to EQ or balance. Thirdly, in general, you want to add effects using buses and then sending to them instead of putting them directly on the track. Not only is this more efficient on your processing power, but it's quicker, it's easier, and generally results in using less effects because you're just adding it to the original sound. And then fourth, keep in mind that any type of compression or mastering limiting will make any reverb or delays louder. So you generally want to add a little less than you think in the mix. And we finally made it to number one. Without a doubt, the biggest distinction between professional sounding commercial tracks and amateurish sounding demos comes down to EQ. Demos often sound dull, muddy, and lack clarity in the mix. Well, pro tracks have a good solid frequency balance, a clear mix, and sound great no matter what system you play them on. EQ is arguably the number one cause of that dreaded demo sound, and it's usually the result of either the lack of it, or more commonly, using it the wrong way. So there's definitely something that sounds a little bit strange about the EQ of this song over here. And when I went through the individual tracks, it didn't look actually too bad. Okay, this is a vocal track over here, and she is rolling off too much low end. It's over, it's from about 250 hertz. You don't want to be rolling off that much low end on a vocal, otherwise it's going to sound very thin, which it does. But for the most part, most of the EQs used are not too bad. This is the piano over here, and nothing wrong with that. Uh, some of these other vocals are a little strange, and my biggest concern is that they are very different from one to the next. Some have a whole lot of 200 hertz boosted over here, and other ones don't have very much, 
and this one down here doesn't have any, and then it's got this top end boosted over here. So you shouldn't really have that much variation in your vocal EQ if it's the same singer and you're using the same mic. But eventually I found the real problem. When I went to the master over here, this is the master EQ that's on the entire mix. And there's some pretty crazy things going on here. She's got 12 dBs of low end being added over here, which explains why the bass is just way too much. There's around 12 dBs added around 2.2K, which is why it's sounding kind of like very sharp and harsh in that range. And there's also a 12 dB 10K shelving filter, which is also not helping things. So this is what it sounds like when I switch this off. I'll play it with it on and then I'll switch it off for you. So you can hear why she did it, because when we take it off, it suddenly sounds very muffled and you can't quite hear what's going on. The problem is, this is on the overall mix and not everything needs to be EQ'd this way. You want to do most of the EQ on the individual tracks where you're only just adjusting that one track and then maybe just make very slight adjustments on the master if you really have to. So what exactly should we be doing with EQ? Well, let me just very quickly give you the four major reasons we use EQ. Number one is to fix any problems with the frequency spectrum. So this is anything that just doesn't sound very good about it. This could be a bass guitar that sounds too boomy, or it could be a harsh sounding drum over air track. Number two is to enhance the various instruments or vocals to sound their best. Now an enhancement is anything that makes the sound better. And this could be making a kick drum fatter, or it could be making a lead vocal brighter and clearer. The third reason is to shape the various instruments to fit together better in the mix. Whenever you try and blend together a whole bunch of different instruments, there's a lot of overlapping frequencies, which leads to a kind of muddy sounding mix. Does this sound familiar? Well, shaping is mostly about taking away frequencies so that we have a cleaner, clearer mix. And fourth, to make sure that the overall frequency balance is similar to other commercial records, what I call sonic consistency, because we want to make sure that the sound is consistent with commercial standards. The reason that commercial tracks sound great no matter what system you play them on is because they have a well-balanced overall frequency spectrum. As a very simple example, they're not too bassy or too trebly, they're kind of somewhere in between. Now obviously we don't have time to get into all the specifics of EQ over here, but here's a couple of key lessons. Number one, when mixing, EQ the individual tracks, not the overall mix. EQ should only be used on the overall track as a last resort when mastering the track if you need to slightly balance out the frequency spectrum. Secondly, use a spectrum analyzer if possible, if you have one available. It's really helpful to compare to other commercial tracks and just get an idea of whether your track is at least in the ballpark. Thirdly, always make sure that you've got two or three commercial tracks to compare to while mixing or mastering. Our ears tend to adapt and get used to a certain sound very quickly. So by comparing to commercial tracks, you'll make sure that you're staying on track. Fourth, listen softly most of the time. This is one of the biggest lessons that I learned, especially when it comes to EQ, because it's very difficult to make fine adjustments when you're listening at a high volume. Your ears get tired very quickly and everything just becomes like a blur. When you listen softly, it's much easier to hear the fine changes. So how softly am I talking here? Well, you should be able to have a normal conversation without raising your voice at all while the track is playing. And lastly, listen at different volumes. So most of the time you should be listening pretty softly, but every now and then you want to turn it up quite loud and then listen at a medium range as well to make sure that you get all the different perspectives because our ears hear frequencies differently at different levels. So if we had to give this track a rating out of five and we subtracted one point for each mistake that's been made, well, like the musical issues, it doesn't do too well. It didn't have any noise or glitches, so that's good, so it keeps a point there. Then for panning, well, there was some weird inconsistent panning going on and the main instruments were a little bit scattered, so we're gonna have to take off a point for that. Then she loses another point for compression and limiting because of all the different settings and the fact that the overall track doesn't even come close to commercial level. Then the effects, well, they were a little bit overpowering, so another one off of that. And finally, the EQ, 
well, it was not only a little bit strange and inconsistent, but putting such a drastic EQ on the master made the entire track sound harsh and filtered, so definitely no point for EQ. So all in all, that's one out of five for the technical aspects. Now, if we combine this rating with the musical rating it got, which unfortunately was zero out of five, the total rating is one out of 10. And that's why it kind of sounds like a one out of 10. You know what the interesting thing is though? Most of these problems can be fixed or at least drastically improved in just a couple of minutes and they're not difficult to do. So to kind of prove the point and to show that it's not all GarageBand's fault, I spent just a few minutes doing exactly that. Now it's not perfect, uh, I didn't you know, go into everything, but it's a lot better. So here's a quick before and after of the same session, all the same tracks, I haven't changed those. I've just basically fixed these mistakes that we've been talking about. Not too bad, is it? Now, of course, some things do need to be re-recorded, but considering that we just used the exact same session and fixed these various mistakes as far as possible, it's pretty impressive what a difference that makes. Now it's time for you to rate one of your tracks. If you haven't done so yet, just download the PDF below this video. You'll find all the points we've just spoken about summarized for you in there. And at the back, you'll find a checklist to help you check your own songs for these five technical mistakes. You want to make sure that you can tick off each of these points. So for example, uh, let's take EQ. One of the points is that it should sound good on most systems. Another is that the mix sounds clear, so not muddy. Now if you can't answer yes to both of these and all the other points under EQ, well you probably got an EQ problem. Now don't feel bad if you do, this just means that you need to make learning this a priority because it's getting in the way of the sound you want. So assuming you've gone through part one, the musical mistakes, you want to combine the musical rating your track got with this technical rating to get your total rating for that track. Now what I recommend you do is write down each area that you lost a point on. So if timing was an issue, write that one down. If compression is the one that you're second guessing, then put that one down. And of course, we can't get into all of these things in this video, this is just to help you discover what these things are, but I encourage you to figure these things out. And this could be getting a book, this could mean getting a training program, whether that's from me or someone else you trust, or it could simply be just browsing YouTube videos or blogs. The main thing is that you now have a clear intention going forward, so you know what it is you're looking for and you know what you need to do to improve. You know, the reason I put together these videos and books for you is because I know firsthand just how frustrating it can be to know what you want your tracks to sound like. You know, you can hear that sound in your head, but not knowing how to make that happen. So I really hope that this has at least helped you to discover what these things are that are holding back your tracks. And I hope that you'll commit to figuring these things out because these are the things that are getting in the way of that sound you want and this is the key to making your song sound really great.